Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of partner relationships. The interview was held on the 19th of August, 2013 in Willsdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session one. Welcome again today. Myself and Mary today are going to be talking about a lot of questions about personal relationships. And by this kind of relationships in this session, we're talking primarily about the relationships relating to a sexual relationship. So de facto, partnership, marriage, all of those kind of relationships we're going to be covering in this section. We find that we get asked a lot of questions about people's personal relationships. Now, not all the time are people very sincere about asking their questions because quite frequently people come to us, just one person of a couple comes to us and asks us questions about their relationship. And we find it's very, very hard to give one person answers about their relationship when we have not seen the relationship itself and how it works together. And also quite frequently the person asking the questions is falsifying the information about their relationship to us in order to get a specific answer. So what we're going to do is break these series, this series up into a number of different sections. The first section is a section that's going to be dealing primarily with the, the right way to handle a relationship from God's perspective. And in that regard, we'll give examples, but not specific answers to individual questions that have been asked of us. In, from the second session onwards, we'll be giving more generalised answers and specific answers to couples that have written in their questions or, or people that have written in their questions. We find that most people are not sincere in the way they look at themselves in a relationship. They are often very, very focused on the way they see other people or their partner, but they are not looking at their own faults in a relationship. And this is something that we're going to discuss a lot about today. So we'd like to invite you to be involved in our discussions. Mary is going to be with us uh, today in the discussion and uh, asking the questions and having some discussions together. And we hope you enjoy this session about personal relationships. And hopefully it does help your own personal relationship with your partner or, or, or your marriage partner. So we'll see how we go today with answering a lot of these kind of general questions. And then on future sessions, we hope to answer specific questions that people have emailed into us on the FAQ channel. What's the most important question that we need to ask ourselves when we're in a relationship? Well, I, I believe the most important question we need to ask ourselves is what would love do? What does love do? That, that is the most important question that we need to ask in a relationship. The whole point of having a relationship is to have a loving relationship, not one where people are fighting and bickering and, and causing all these troubles with each other all the time. So we need to be focused, and that involves each person in the relationship being focused on that one question, what would love do in this situation? What would love do? The problem with that question is this. The majority of us are so damaged in love from our childhood generally or from our environmental things as we were growing up that we have, we have or we believe that we know what love would do mm -hmm. when often it's not what God's love would do. So you could say the really biggest question again, the bigger question than what would love do is what would God's love do is probably the most important question that you could actually ask. So if we're focused on what would God's love do rather than what would love do, we will find actually that quite often what we believe is loving in terms of an action is not what God acts like. So therefore it is not loving from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. And so we need to understand the difference between these two questions. What would love do and what would God's love do? We must understand that in the end what we're aiming for is what God's love would do and not what humans' definition of love would do. And to do that, we have to confront within ourselves our own personal definitions of love. What I see happening a lot of times is people are not confronting their own definitions of love. They believe their own definitions of love to be correct. And when they believe these definitions of love to be correct, the problem is 
they then act upon their own definitions of love when frequently their own definition of love is completely different to their partner's definition of love. And of course, that brings up lots of issues. Whereas if we're both in the relationship aiming for what God's love will do, eventually we'll have the same definition of love within each of us. And so therefore we're able to resolve the question of what would love do the mm -hmm. same way. Whereas when we begin, we're asking this question, what does love do? It's almost like asking the question, we'd be asking the question, what does my love do? And what does your love do? And because we have different versions of love, because we've been brought up differently, we've had different experiences during our childhood and adolescence and adulthood, we then have a different opinion of what love should do. And in the end, we have to learn that we need to give up this opinion of what we think love should do and instead absorb what God's love would do, what God's opinion of love would be. So just to clarify, you're mm. saying that we can be damaged in our understanding of what real love is because of our childhood experiences. Of course. And, and we, we have often very serious flaws in what we understand love to be. Like a person who's brought up in an abusive environment believes that getting smacked around occasionally is a loving act. Yeah. So we, we often have very distorted viewpoints of what love would allow us to do and also allow us to accept from someone else. Right. Yeah. But then you're saying if we examine how God loves, then we can start to begin to have a proper understanding of what love would do in terms of... Yes, because it's impossible for us to see our own flaws unless we have something to compare it with. And the problem I see for most people is they have a very strong personal definition of what they believe love to be. But, but unfortunately, their strong personal definition is not anything associated with God's version of love. You know, it's, it's only what they want love to be based often upon what addictions they've developed over the period of their life and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so they then project that on their partner. And of course that creates major problems with their partner and, and major problems in the relationship and the smoothness of the relationship. And we see so much pain and suffering in relationships today and so much emotional energy gets pumped into the relationships that have a lot of pain and suffering involved. And the whole reason why a lot of this pain and suffering is occurring is because our definition of love is flawed. So while we need to ask ourselves the question, what does love do or what would love do? We also need to be aware that our own concept of love being seriously flawed needs to be supplemented. That question needs to be supplemented with the real question is what does God's love do? So we're changing our focus now. We're changing our focus and what do I want out of the relationship to what does God think is a good relationship? What, what is God's definition of a relationship? What, how does God see things? How, how, does God, how did God design us to interact with each other? Yeah. What, how, how does God see love occurring in the relationship itself? These are the primary questions that we need to ask ourselves rather than always focusing on what are my selfish motivations for being in this relationship. And once we work our way through those, that primary question and, and everything we can say today is going to be based on that primary question, mm -hmm. what would God's love do? Everything has to be based on that question because our own definition of what love would do will often be flawed. And I guess taking that viewpoint of what would God or what does God's love do helps us step back from our selfish viewpoint of what's actually going on. Of course. Yeah. And it also helps both of us in the relationship work towards an ideal. Mm. Whereas when both of us are just focused on our own definition, so my, if I entered a relationship with you focused on my own definition of love, then I'll be going, why isn't Mary doing this? Why isn't Mary doing that? What's the problem with Mary now? Like, why is she, why is she acting this way? Why is she acting that way? She's not doing what, you know, and, and I'd be very focused on getting my addictions met and I'd think that's love. Yeah. And as a result of focusing on my addictions, every time you didn't, you know, look after my addictions, I'd be going, what's going on here? Well, you know, there's something wrong. This is not a very nice relationship. I think I'll go and find someone else who's <laughs> going to focus on my addictions or whatever. Yeah. And that's not the ideal. The ideal is... What is God's definition of love? How can we both work towards God's definition of love? And in fact, I feel probably there is an important aspect of this that we need to raise, and that is, do we even want to? And I feel that is probably the, the first question 
that each person needs to ask us, each other in the relationship. I need to ask myself in our relationship, do I really want to love as God loves in this relationship? Yeah. And if you ask the same question, do I really want to love as God loves in this relationship? And both of us are working towards that ideal. There's a very high likelihood our relationship will, will, will stand any strains. And the only time our relationship would eventually part under those circumstances is if we discovered through this process that we weren't soulmates. But even if we were growing towards this I, this um, ideal, ideal of loving the way God loves, mm -hmm. even that parting wouldn't be acrimonious, would it? Not at all. It would be a very friendly parting. We would still um, probably enjoy the company of the person. We wouldn't be wanting a soulmate relationship with the person. We wouldn't be wanting a sexual relationship with the person. But we could still cope with the parting quite easily, in fact, if we had those particular ideals. What I see is most people don't have those ideals, of course. So, so I want my addictions met, you want your addictions met. As long as both of our addictions are codependent, we'll have an okay relationship. And that's how the average relationship on the planet is. Yeah. It's a constant codependency between two people. And quite often I find it funny in some ways when people come up and ask us questions about their relationship because they do not understand that they're complaining all about all these things in their husband or wife and uh, but, but frequently their husband and wife has just as long a list or if not a longer one of all the complaints they have about the the per who, person who's come up to ask us the questions but because the person who's coming up to ask these questions often doesn't have their partner with them, we can't address those particular issues. Whereas, uh, whereas God addresses both parties in the relationship. God's love, if we were both focused on God's love, would address both parties in the relationship. And so I feel, let's say I'm an atheist and I want to have a better relationship, then of course I'll probably not consider God. Yeah. And then I've got to ask myself the question, what would love do? But often the answer is going to be what I feel love would do and not what love in its pure form would do. Yeah. And that's the problem that we face if we're not focused on what would God's love do. Mm -hmm. And I feel that uh, if we focus ourselves on what would God's love do, we will very rapidly get answers about what we should be doing in similar situations. Mm -hmm. So in our relationship with our partner, what do I do in this situation? Well, what does God love do in that situation with me? and then we can easily determine what we could do with each other. But to do that, I have to want it. And that's where it gets down to. D does the person in the relationship really have the will to work through their issues in the relationship? Often people come up to us, as you know, and they basically try to set us up, really. Mm -hmm. but, but because they want to leave the relationship and they're just looking for a reason why. Mm -hmm. and, and they think that if, if they can come up to ask and ask a question and get a certain answer, then that gives them the reason why they should leave. And I don't go for that very much, of course, because to me that's insincere. If a person's going to just ask a question without wanting any truth and they already have made a choice in their own mind that they want to leave, then why haven't they already left? Like, and take full responsibility rather than trying to blame me for it. <laughs> um, so I've, and also they're missing the, the point, aren't they, that you're raising, which is... Which is always about love. Yeah. Like what's out of harmony with love in you, not, not in your partner, in you. You know, a lot of times we have people coming up and they go, my partner does this, my partner does that, my partner does that. I'm going, yeah, what do you do? Oh, I'm perfect. And I say, are you perfect? No. So what do you do? Like, what, what is it that you do that's out of harmony with love, that you know is out of harmony with love? And they go, oh, but, but, you know, they always want to put the focus back on their partner. I don't feel that is a very sincere process. If you really want to have a good relationship with your partner, focus firstly on your flaws. Focus firstly on what you need to improve. Stop focusing on your partner. Focus firstly on how are you going to love what, how God loves Mm -hmm. Or how are you going to love in a pure manner if you're not interested in God at all? Ask that at least that question. How are you going to love in a pure manner? Is your love pure at the moment? What does your partner think? Is, does your partner think your love's pure at the moment? Right? Mm -hmm. These are all important questions, all revolving around this one question, what does love do? What would God's love do? So I feel that's the primary first question that every single person should ask themselves. What does God love do? The second question involved with that is, do I really want to love the way 
God loves? Do I really want to love in a pure way? Or is the only reason why I'm having a relationship just to have all of my addictions met? So my suggestion is if that's the case, that your only reason why you want a relationship is to get all your addictions met, then you're probably in a relationship like that already. <laughs> but if not, then forget the relationship you're in and go and find one that meets all of your addictions. In the end, you're not going to be very happy. You both won't be very happy. No. You'll both create a lot of pain and suffering doing that. And in the long run, your life isn't going to be very pleasant as a result, but that's your choice. My suggestion instead of doing that is stop wanting to get you just your own addictions met and look at how do you purify your love with your partner so that you can have a beautiful relationship, one that's functional, beautiful and, and full of passion and desire. Mm. And I suppose if we realise that we don't want to love as God loves, why not? Exactly. Because if we think about it logically, <clears throat> God's got an abundance of love for everyone and wouldn't that be great? And God's happy all the time. Exactly. So that seems like a good thing to aim for. So why wouldn't I want to? to love in the way that God loves. Exactly. Yeah. And what, what I find is that most people who don't feel like loving the way God's love are actually in a huge amount of rebellion about love. Mm -hmm. They're in a huge amount of anger about love, which they're not getting rid of. That covers over a large amount of sadness generally about love that they're not willing to release. And so they come into a relation and go, I want you to do what I want. I want, I want to control. I want to manipulate. I want to get exactly what I want. And, and, of course, you're not going to have a great relationship like this. And, in fact, many of the people who have that attitude don't finish up having a relationship at all for that reason. Nobody can put up with them <laughs> because they have not considered, they're so angry about loving in a pure manner, they don't want to love in a pure manner. And so what do they do? They just avoid the whole question of love altogether and focus on getting their addictions met. That is not the way to have a pure relationship. The way to have a pure relationship is firstly focus on the question, how or what would love do mm -hmm. in this situation? And if you don't know what your love would do, ask yourself, what does God's love do in this situation? That is the best question to ask right up front. Lovely. Thank yeah. you. So can you give some examples of what God's love does do and does not do? Okay, so with the question, what does God's love do? Obviously, there's the other question, which is what does God's love not do? In other words, what God doesn't do. And I feel there's lots of examples here. You know, you could list, because basically what you're doing here is listing what you know about the quality of God's love and how it is established and delivered to humanity. And then you can ask, you know, apply those particular things to yourself. So let's look at what God doesn't do. Right. God doesn't control, manipulate, browbeat, force, punish or force people to do anything spiritually, emotionally, physically or sexually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so God doesn't force anything to happen or manipulate anything to happen or control anything into happening. God honours the free will at all times. So God doesn't do all these other manipulative things. So God doesn't manipulate people's will? No. God doesn't force them into a certain way of action. Everything is based around what the person wants in the long run. So, so if we were going to love how God loves, then we would not do that either. We would not force, coerce, manipulate, control any person into loving us. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't lie to them in order for them to love us. So we would never do any of those kind of things automatically if we loved how God loved. Great. Yeah. What are some other examples like... What about rescuing us? Oh, of course, like if we look at the average person on earth, they believe that, you know, rescuing somebody is a great thing. You know, it's lovely to have be rescued. That means somebody loves you. Well, God doesn't rescue any of us. If, if you look at what happens with our personal lives generally, when we get into trouble and we ask God to be rescued, we don't, generally don't get rescued. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because God wants us to take full personal responsibility for our own lives and our own choices and decisions. So in a relationship, if we loved how God loved, we wouldn't rescue the other person from their own choices and decisions. We wouldn't do that. So God doesn't do it. God lets us experience the negative consequences of what we've created. Always. So God never takes away those negative things. No. So, so if you look at the situation where, for example, a person overspends financially, 
right? Um, and then they pray to God, please give me some money to fix this problem. God won't give them any money to fix the problem, right? That they will have spent over, overspent financially and they will have to take the consequences of it. God wants them to, in fact, to work out the reasons why they chose to do such a thing that was unloving to themselves and others in the first place. So God's focus is not on having a person um, be rescued every time they make a mistake. He allows us to make mistakes. He doesn't punish us for our mistakes, but each mistake we make has a consequence that we need to feel before we'll learn from it. And so if we in a relationship try to rescue our partner from all the mistakes they make all the time, then a partner is never going to learn anything. They're going to keep making the same mistakes all the time. Yeah. They're going to keep doing the same things all the time. So if we love, if, if, if we look at what God's love doesn't do, doesn't rescue people. So our love shouldn't rescue people. <laughs> what else doesn't God's love do for us in relation to truth, for example? Or... Well, God's love uh, doesn't. Uh, withhold the truth from people, for example. So if we look at uh, our co common relationships that we see around us, most people withhold truth from their partner at some point. You know, it could be just a simple thing, like your wife comes up, she's in a new dress, or she just put on a new pair of jeans. She comes up and says, does my bum look fat in that? You know, and we know that if we say yes, that she's probably going to get pretty grumpy with this because she doesn't really want to know the truth, right? And so we go, oh, no, you, know, you, look, you look good in that, that's fine. When inside you're just thinking, yeah, you're getting a bit wide there on the backside now, you know, and that, but we're unwilling to say the truth because we're afraid, right? God's love is not afraid of truth ever, mm -hmm. ever. So God's love does not withhold truth. God's love allows the truth always to be spoken. So it's very important to understand. Mm. What else does God not do in terms of, you've spoken about God doesn't withhold truth. What about does God then force us to do things or force no, us to, no, so to know what we should do? No, this is a beautiful thing about God, isn't it? That you, on one hand, God doesn't uh, withhold the truth from us. There's always, like if you look at all of God's laws, there's a law of attraction, law of cause and effect and all that, always trying to show us the truth, always trying to show us the truth. Of course, we can ignore that. But God's laws, moment by moment, are showing us truth. But on the other hand, while those laws show us the truth, they don't force us to do what the truth is. Mm -hmm. So they don't force us into conforming to a certain truth. They don't force us into tr you know, doing what God believes you should do because God honours the fact you've got free will. You're allowed to make the choice yourself. So while God does expose the truth, God doesn't then get all grumpy and upset and angry and rageful because you don't follow it. So God doesn't... Uh give us pep talks or guilt trips or exactly. uh, have arguments with us about the truth. So if every second day I'm sitting down with my partner giving them a pep talk, I don't get a pep talk from God. I don't get that kind of discussion with God. So if I'm sitting down with my partner giving them a pep talk about something or giving them some encouraging speech in order to encourage them and to be more loving, that's not loving at all. In fact, it would be loving if we allowed them to be more loving Right? Mm -hmm. And we just share the truth and then allow them to make their own decisions about those, what they're going to do about it. We don't try to, try to make them go a certain direction by encouraging them a certain direction. We need to give them the space to make up their own mind. Now, hopefully, if they want to love, they will finish up making up their own mind in harmony with love. But they may not. And really, it's none of our business which way that goes, with the exception of we're allowed to make a choice about our resultant action if they choose to do mm -hmm. such things. So, so, for example, if you choose to yell at me every day, and that is a, obviously an unloving action, no matter what is going on, if you choose to yell at me every day, after a while I might go, well, I don't know if I want to live with a person who's yelling at me every day, you know. But I don't or shouldn't try to stop you from yelling at me every day. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, God doesn't stop you from yelling at me every day. This is a part of how God's trying to help us understand the use of our own will and of develop course. this desire to, to know it. Well, a lot of it is about a, a, developing a desire to love. As I said mm -hmm. in the answer to the first question, what I feel is happening for most people is that most of us don't really have a, a strong desire to love as much as we believe, right? We have a strong desire to meet our addictions, but we don't often have a strong desire to love as God loves. And so God doesn't encourage within us a desire, 
by going, having a pep talk every day and discussing with us why we should love. Mm -hmm. We have to come to our own conclusions as to why we should love. And in the end, we'll come to understand through that process that when we love, we have a happier life. When we love, we have more sex. When we love, we have more joy. We have more, when we love, in the relationship I'm talking about now. When we love, we get along a lot better. When we love, you know, and once we see that, we go, well, of course I want to love. Mm -hmm. Because when we love, all of these more harmonious and more beautiful things happen in my life. And then that desire, as it increases, will cause us to go, okay, I want to love. And we'll be wanting to know how to love our partner rather than going, rather than going, my partner's not loving me, I'm out, I'm out of here type of thing the instant it happens, rather than working through the issues of love. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so in t you mentioned addictions mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of things that God <coughs> does not do. Yeah, so God does not feed our addictions. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for us to understand that. So in a relationship, you see often people feeding each other's addictions. We call it codependence, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm happy for you to have a certain set of addictions. Like let's say you have an addiction to, to cooking because when you cook and I come home and go, oh, it's a beautiful meal, you get to feel like, oh, that's so nice. I cooked a good meal. I'm a good person. I'm a good woman. I'm a good wife, whatever. Um, and you don't allow me to cook at all <laughs> or take any responsibility for my own life because if I'd cooked one night, you wouldn't get that feeling. Yeah. Right? Or the man might come home thinking, I want to have the meal cooked for me because I've been working all day. And that's an addiction in itself because he's getting away from the point of self-responsibility. He is responsible for his own cooking. And if the wife happens to do it for him, then it's a gift she's giving him. Right? And if he's just addicted to it and he gets angry when she do he doesn't get it, that tells you that he's addicted to it, mm -hmm. um, then he's out of harmony with God's love. He's out of harmony with loving. So it, this issue of addictions is a big issue in relationships where people enter codependent addictions in the relationship and then when one half of the relationship tries to correct that, then they find the other half getting angry and upset and saying, you don't love me anymore, what's wrong, you, know, you don't care about me anymore, when reality is the first situation, feeding the addiction, wasn't loving. Mm. And we know that because God doesn't feed our addictions. Of course. Yep. So um, what about the issues, issues of anger and fear? God doesn't respond to our fear or our anger, really. Not really, no. If you, you try getting angry at God and saying, look, you know, if you, God, do this, do that, you know, swearing, carrying on at God because you didn't get something you wanted from God. Did you find at the end of all of that you got something you wanted from God? <laughs> no. God, didn't hear it. God doesn't listen to a whole lot of it. <laughs> yeah. So God doesn't pander to our anger. No. Um, or get it punishing with our anger. So Neither. God doesn't punish us back. Because we're angry. Yeah. So God doesn't get angry back because we're yeah. angry with God. Yeah. So, so if we look at what would happen in a relationship, then since God doesn't get angry, then we wouldn't get angry. And if we're getting angry all the time in the relationship, then something's out of harmony with love. If, if we're getting angry in order to manipulate or control the other person, well, God doesn't do that. He doesn't get in a rage and try to punish us for something we did wrong. He just lets us feel the consequences of what we did. Yep. That's all he does. So, and God doesn't say, oh, you're angry. Okay, I'll do that. No, it doesn't pander to the anger. Yeah. It doesn't go, oh, okay, I'm angry and I'm afraid of your anger now, so I better do it. Can you yep. imagine God sitting up there going, yes, uh, Mary's really upset with me today because she hasn't got, you know, the million dollars she wants in the bank. So I think I'll give her the million dollars today because I really need Mary's approval. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of course that's not going to happen, right? No. And it's never going to happen. Yeah. And uh, the reality is I don't know anybody that's happened to you either <laughs> because that's not the way God actually operates with people. Yeah. And, and yet it is frequently the way people in relationships operate where yeah. they get angry when the other party doesn't give them what they want. Mm -hmm. that, that's very frequent. And I suppose God is very similar when it comes to our emotions of fear. God doesn't respond. God fear, yeah. doesn't take away our fear. If we see fear, it's interesting the way women and men generally on the planet respond to fear. If, if a woman notices her man afraid, she often gets upset with him because she wants him to stand up, you know. But if a man notices a woman afraid, he generally wants to make her fear go away, right? Because when she's afraid, there's no love coming out of her at all towards him or mm -hmm. you know, towards anything that's going on in the relationship. And so he, most men finish up pandering to the fear of their women 
and most women finish up attacking the fear of their men. Mm -hmm. That's a generalisation, but it is fairly accurate for most people. Either way of dealing with fear is out of harmony with love. Because it's not how God deals with it. It's not how him. God does it. Yeah. God doesn't pander to fear or make fear go away. God wants us to experience fear. God wants us to feel our way through our fear. Mm -hmm. so, so, of course, God's not going to pander to it. And then on the other hand, God doesn't want to punish us for having fear. Like, so every time we're afraid, God doesn't get out the stick and beat us as well, you know, give us something more to be afraid about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, God knows that this fear is a terrible traumatic thing inside of us, but we need to let it out. We need to feel it. So God has a very balanced view of how to handle fear. If we look at relationships today, most people don't have a balanced view of how to handle fear. They either pander to the fear of their partner or they attack the fear of their partner. Yeah. One or the other. Yeah. They don't actually have this loving viewpoint of how to handle fear. Mm. I suppose the other beautiful thing that God doesn't do is that God doesn't respond to our facade or uh, what we would like to present to the world. Exactly. God's yeah. not interested in our facade at all. At all. Mm -hmm. God doesn't care what we look like to the world. God only cares what our character and nature is internally. So God wants a relationship with the real us. Even if the real us is pretty bad at the moment, God would still like to have a relationship with the real us. Mm -hmm. Now, if we apply that to a relationship, we would not try to have all a big facade with our partner just in order to get their approval. So you see this happening in many developing relationships where there's a big facade and so the person gets to know them, enters a relationship with them, and all of a sudden the facade gets dropped. You yeah. often see the, uh, this happening when a person's married. You know, all yeah. of a sudden what happened before they're married and what happened after they're married, very, very different. Why was that? Because before they were married, they were in a facade. Yeah. And after they're married, some other emotions kicked in, such as, oh, I'm safe now, I'm secure now. He's tied, Honeymoon's to, over. He's tied to yeah. me through a, a, legal, through a document. legal document. Now, not that it's really true, he's tied to me now, he could lose things now if he doesn't do the right thing. And so that means I can be safe and so I can put on a bit of weight and not care for myself and I can eat different food now and I can do all sorts of things now because I can get away with all of that. Now, that's not the way God loves. God, God wants us to be real all the time. Mm -hmm. so, so if a person finds that before they were married they were acting one way and then after they married they are acting a different way, they were in a facade, either at one or both ends of that spectrum. And they need to address why they'd be in a facade if they loved the way God loves. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and I suppose perhaps one of the most um, challenging things about God's love is that it doesn't flow unless we want truth at the same time. Exactly. This is a very interesting point about God's love, I feel, in that unless a person desires to be in harmony with truth, God's love in that moment cannot flow into the individual. So God wants to love the individual, but the love can't flow. There's no, there's no flow into the individual because the individual is preventing the love from flowing because love is based upon truth. Mm -hmm. So if we look at a relationship, we often see people who think they're in love, but they've lied to their partner in the course of a day, often lied many times to their partner. That is not love. You can't be close like that. Mm -hmm. You can only be close in a relationship by telling the truth. God knows that. The way people on earth act is that they can lie about this, lie about... They can even lie about having sex with somebody else and still think they're in a good relationship. Yeah. Not true. Yeah. You can't. It's all just a facade. The whole lot's fake. And the reality is love cannot flow between two people who are not in truth with each other. And I can, I can relate to that from my personal perspective <coughs> mm -hmm. in that um, I feel that you love me very much and I have a lot of evidence for that in the way you behave, in the things you say, in the way you act. Yeah. And but the passion and desire I have for you That as you a express, and, and yes. The amount of things I want to know about you and understand about you and so forth. All of those things. Mm. And um, because I don't often even just want to face the truth about myself, not even the truth about... It, sometimes I feel I have better feelings about you than I do about myself. I agree, yeah. Um, because I don't want to face that truth, I can't really be connected to myself and therefore I can't even feel love coming no. from you. I can't receive the love. So uh, it's one of those things that works both ways. It does. If I don't want to face the truth about my real feelings about you, then no love can really flow between us. But no. 
equally, if if one partner is... If you don't want to is, face the real feelings about the truth about yourself... Even if I have a high regard for you and have a feeling that I would like to have a love connection with you, yeah. we can't actually connect. Not really, because you're constantly going to be thinking that I will have the same feelings that you have about you. Yes. Which, which is not true, of course, but, uh, but unfortunately we often believe that's true. And so unless we face the truth on a number of levels, the truth about how we feel about the other person but also the truth about how we feel about ourselves, mm -hmm. then it's going to be very, very hard for love to flow between the two of us. And that's, that I suppose, this discussion is about what God does not do mm. and God's love can't really flow to us while we're not in a state of truth. About ourselves or the other person. Yeah, yeah. and, and it's a, an amazing way God's just created the soul, isn't it? That it is. even when love is present, it can't flow into us unless we desire truth personally. Exactly. And in fact, I believe personally and have done for many thousands of years, <laughs> as you know, that actually love without truth is not actually possible. It's not it's not, it's not actually it's love, not actually is it? Love. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. just addictions and dependencies yeah. and it's not actually love anyway. So unless we see many couples holding on to the truth about how they truly feel about themselves and the other person in the relationship. And while you're holding on to the truth and not discussing it with the other party in the relationship, it's impossible to have a close relationship. And so we see them trying to have a close relationship but doing things that make it physically impossible to have a close relationship. Mm -hmm. God doesn't do that. God's always encourage, encouraging truth between ourselves and God. So, so once we engage that same process with God, we'll always have a close relationship mm. with God. And God knows that. You know, from God's end, there's no problems with truth. <laughs> yep. you know, God's not afraid of it, angry about it, upset about it or any of those things. We are the people often that get angry about it, upset about it, scared of it, frightened. You know, we, we often have a lot of grief about truth as well that we need to experience. And we need to be open to experiencing those emotions if we're truly going to have a close relationship with our partner. Yeah, okay, so I guess we've just run through some examples really of what God's yes. love does not do. And like I said, we could come up with hundreds of other examples. Um, and it's, I feel the reason why we wanted to discuss this right up front is that we want to see that God's love does not do certain things. Yeah. A lot of people have this viewpoint that God's love allows everything. That is not true. God's love does not allow everything. God's love has a very fixed, determined things that it does allow and things that it does not allow, right? Yeah. And love itself is the same. Yes, mm. yeah. So perhaps just by way of summary, I can just run through those things sure. that you've explained there sure. just, um, just briefly. So God's love does not control us, manipulate us, threaten us or force us to do anything against our own will. Yes. God's love does not rescue us from our own negative creations, mm -mm. but rather has compassion. Yeah, and, and understanding and all of those things. And actually helps us come to an understanding of what we've done and yes. how to fix what we've done even. Exactly. And also it doesn't punish us for what we've done, but yeah. wants us always to move forward in a positive direction to repair what we've done. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose that's the issue of when we're rescued, it prevents that whole process of understanding and then being yep. able to fix it. Exactly. It? And yeah. it also it prevents the individual from having some degree of personal responsibility in the end. So, so it prevents the pe person from understanding how to fix the problem in the future if it ever occurs again. Yeah. And, and this is the beautiful thing about God's love is God's love teaches us to such an extent that in the end, we know how to fix it over and over again. We know yeah. if we hit that same situation again, we fix it the same way and it always gets fixed. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. That actually gets prevented in a lot of relationships exactly. because we do the opposite. Exactly, because yeah. we rescue instead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, God's love does not withhold from us the truth about ourselves, yep. but rather exposes the truth at every moment through the laws of attraction, cause and effect, and sh through these laws, showing us our own conditions, our own condition and attractions All the about time. what is happening. Yeah. yeah. So God's love isn't withholding information mm. about ourselves from us. Yeah. God, in fact, created a huge amount of laws to give us information <laughs> about the truth about ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. 
God's love does not give us pep talks, no. lectures, no. arguments, or how we should hey. act, behave, or feel. Yes, and God's love doesn't prepare us for the future way we should act. Yeah. Right. God's love is always encouraging us to feel how we feel right now and act upon how we feel right now in harmony with love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God's love does not show us where we've gone wrong when we're not open to seeing that truth. Exactly. Or when we're avoiding the truth or finding out other truth. Yes. So God's love, in other words, doesn't expose the truth to us unless we want the truth as well. So we've mm -hmm. got to want it. It doesn't, it's sort of like, there's all these laws that expose the truth to us, but, but the, I suppose this, the flavour is this, is that yeah. it, it doesn't sort of, um, those truths cannot enter us unless we're willing to absorb them. So yeah, the and this is, this is interesting because you've been discussing all these points in relationship, uh, in regards to, to a having relationship. a relationship. Yeah. Um, and so one of the previous points was that God's love never withholds truth from exactly. us. So if I'm considering that in my relationship, mm -hmm. then I would never withhold truth from, my, truth from my partner. Exactly. But in this point, we're saying um, God's love doesn't actually show us where we've gone wrong unless we want truth. So how would I, how would I marry those two well, principles within a relationship? Well, the best way to probably think of it is that God's love doesn't, the truth of what God's love is attempting to show us doesn't actually enter us unless there is an openness within ourselves to desire the truth to enter us. Mm -hmm. We see this happening in relationships all the time, if you think about it. Yeah. If, if you tell you the truth to a partner and they don't want to know it, it doesn't enter them at all. Mm -mm. So if you, were, if you say to them, you, every time you burp in front of my friends, I feel embarrassed, <laughs> and they go, you know, again, you know, just to make the point, they're not hearing what you're saying. And how much it distresses you, and what's going on for, yeah. for you, you know, for you in that situation. I'm not saying that he should stop burping. I'm just saying that he's not listening to you about how yeah. you feel. Yeah. Uh, whereas God's love always listens to a person about how it feels when when it's properly expressed. And the person, if we were in the state of love, we would listen to how the other person feels. Yeah. yeah. And also, I suppose <coughs> God's love. It sort of goes back to that lecture, like. Lecture principle, God's love, or if I was to act in harmony with God's love, I might say, look, when you burp in front of my friends, I get embarrassed. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't then go beyond that and say, and the reason you've got that issue is because you have no uh, self-respect and therefore, or, or whatever, I wouldn't then want to hammer home a big lesson to you unless you said, oh, want to know why. I want to know why. Yeah. And God's love waits for the person to want to know why. Mm. We, it's always trying to expose why, of course. Yeah. You know, so it's with always, truth. With truth. Yeah. But, but the person has to want to know why before it's going to enter them. Yeah. And this is the same in a relationship. But God knows that. So God yeah. is always waiting for us to want to know things. Yeah. Then more can be exposed to us. Yeah. It's the same in a relationship. If we're in a partnership where the other partner doesn't want to know anything about what they do, then it's impossible really to, to share any truth with them. And, and also, it's impossible to be close. It's impossible to be close. But and also I think about that in terms of on my end, mm -hmm. am I desiring this truth from my partner? Because if I'm hearing them paying lip service to it and acting in the same way, I haven't really received a truth Not about this. Not at all. Yeah. If I keep doing the same thing, and I can see that the partner has a point in terms of it's not harmonious with love of friends or family or, or, or my partner, and I keep doing the same thing over and over again, then I don't really care. Mm. And I'm demonstrating to my partner that I don't really care for them, actually. Yeah. That's what I'm demonstrating. And I suppose another, I'm sort of talking about this point because I feel that people can get a bit stuck here around mm. issues of truth mm -hmm. and make excuses for not telling the truth or mm. make excuses for hammering their partner with the truth. Yes, and both... Things and are wrong. Both things are wrong. And mm. I feel it's very clear, but mm. I, I'm yeah. sort of developing this discussion because I know that people get stuck around sure. this issue. Sure. Because I suppose the other way um, or the other aspect of this truth is that God does not show us where we've gone wrong when we're not open to seeing the truth mm -hmm. or when we're avoiding the truth is that if I say to you, look, I've got an issue with you being unloving towards uh, my family, mm -hmm. And you say, yes, yes, okay, and then things don't change. 
it, God's love, or, or it's not loving for me then to keep hammering you with this same truth and say, look, you're not being loving, you're not being loving, you're not being loving. Not at all. Yeah. I'm medi- God's, not, God's not doing that to you. No. So why, why would I? I do it to you? But then I'm God's love doesn't some... tolerate the behaviour either. Exactly. So God's love, you know, God, God just sort of, you could say, leaves the relationship. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's not the way it really works. By doing such an action, we've automatically left the relationship yes. and all God does is reflect that to us. And that's, I mean, I feel that's the same thing for a relationship between you and I. Yeah. If, if you are continually doing something that's unloving towards our soul. Or to, towards other people. Or towards other people. Raising with me. You've left the relationship in terms of love. Exactly, I have. So I can only honour your will. Exactly, by leaving by the leaving as the well. relationship as well, because you're showing me you don't want this same relationship based on love. Exactly, as God loves. Exactly. So, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make that clear for yeah, people. Yeah. yeah, but again, like we got to be careful here of not making a heap of rules for people, right? Because this is all about just asking the question: How does God love me? How does God love me at the moment? How, like, do I get my addictions met? No. So why am I trying to meet the addictions of my partner? I've got to have some personal investment in why. Do I, does God try to control me? No. Why am I trying to control my partner? Mm. Yeah. Does God try to you know, falsify a heap of things to me? No. God tells me the raw truth exactly as it is through the laws of attraction and cause and effect. Why am I trying to falsify things with my partner? Mm-hmm. And this will help me address a lot of issues internally. Remember, it's a personal question. It's not a question of how do you do things God's way. It's a mm-hmm. question of what does God do with me? How can I do the same thing with my partner? Mm-hmm. Now, if both my partner and myself were focused on this self-analysis, then you could see immediately you'd have a much better relationship. Absolutely. So, so you know, the guy who's going, the woman is running around tidying up after a fella, you know, she'd be sitting down going, I know this isn't loving. Now, the fella, he thinks that's great because he's getting all of his clothes tidied up. But if he asked her, what do you feel about it? Do you feel that's loving? She'd go, no, it's definitely not loving. Right? And so if he was tr- truthful about it, he'd ask himself, well, okay, maybe her viewpoint's distorted. So let, let me think about how God does things. Because God tidy up God's own messes. Well, God doesn't even create a mess in the first place. It's only people who create messes, right? Yeah. So God doesn't even create a mess in the first place to be tidied up. So if I was loving to you, I would not even create a mess in the first place that you have to tidy up. And I certainly would not, after creating such a mess, expect you to tidy it up. Right? It would be such an unloving thing for me to do. But by asking myself the question, how does God do, what does God do in this situation, I now have a much clearer perspective of what I need to do in the relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. But if I don't believe in God, why not just ask your partner, do you think it's loving that I do this for you? <laughs> you'll get a pretty frank answer generally under those circumstances yeah, yeah. and you'll have a very good idea what's out of harmony and love. So, so the woman who tries to control a partner says, look, I know I try to control you a lot and I do control you a lot. How do you feel about that? And he'll go, to be frank with you, most of the time I feel like leaving you because you do it. You know, like, and I just finish up putting up with it. I don't feel it's loving at all. And then she'd have to go, well, maybe his viewpoint's distorted and mine's right, but I don't think so. Yeah. You know, if you were truly if you open were sincere and sincere, you sincere wouldn't do that. About, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose <clears throat> um, it's good that you raised that about not making rules because I often feel uncomfortable talking about relationships of uh, mm. issues of relationship because I see very much that people take it on in terms of pointing the finger. Always and take it on in terms of pointing Not in terms the of pointing the finger at ourselves yes. and being being sincere about looking at things and they go, oh, well, I saw they said this thing and you're not doing this thing and so, so therefore... So you, 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 you. And, and that's really missing the very first point. Totally missing the point. Yeah. What for me does God love to? Yeah. What, what for me would love to? Yeah. They're the questions, they're personal questions. They're not about what would love do, what yes. would you do. <laughs> it's about yeah. what, what would, would I, I do, do? if yeah. I was loving here. So you could be yelling and screaming at me, what does God love do? Mm-hmm. God's love wouldn't retaliate and yell and scream back. Mm. God's love would sit there, feel about what's going on, and if you'd either leave, right, or you'd sit there and wait till the tirades finish and maybe have a smile about it and can have compassion and understanding for it. Either way is fine. Mm-hmm. That's what God's love would do. It wouldn't yell and scream back. 
Exactly. Uh, and wouldn't threaten you, wouldn't say, I'm leaving you now that you've just yelled and screamed. It wouldn't threaten you. Yeah, we might leave the situation briefly, but God's love would have compassion. And if I don't have compassion for you, yeah. or vice versa, and God's love then I already... God's love understands why the person might be angry. Probably God's, God understands it far better than we do, of course. Yeah. Oftentimes in a relationship, we're not as understanding as we believe ourselves to be, but God does understand. So, so what can I understand? about why you're angry. Mm. See, why you're angry might be because I've done something that you need to be angry about or that yeah. you feel angry about. Yeah. You know, it also could be because you want an addiction met that I'm not meeting. Either one way means I've got something to work with and the other way you've got something to work with. But if I'm open to responding the way God responds, then I'd at least have, I'd be in the position to be able to love more as a result. Yeah. But you can see that to ask this question, you've really got to want to, you've got to want to like be loving yourself. That's right. And sometimes I do, where we talk to people about relationships, <clears throat> sometimes I do feel like throwing my hands up in the air and saying, there's not much more I can say because you haven't fulfilled. The first question is, do I actually want to love in this situation? Exactly. And unless that's an an answer in the positive, yep. anything else we talk about you can it's, just be manipulated to exactly. suit your own addictive yep. ends, really. So maybe if I can extend that, a lot of people come up to us and ask us a question about their personal emotions in their relationship. Oftentimes they're asking a question when the feeling I'm getting from them is they don't want to love. Mm. They're asking the question for alternative reasons. They don't want to have to love. Now... My feelings are this, if you don't want to love, you're going to look for excuses to not love. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. You're going to look for reasons to not love. If you want to love, you will look for reasons to love. Right? The two different places, totally different places, they're opposite ends almost of the spectrum. So when a person comes up and asks the question about their relationship, the first question they really need to be asked in return is, do you want to love? Because that's not the feeling I'm getting here. What I'm feeling is you want them to love you. Mm. See, the, the, that's the problem that I see in most relationships. They want the other person to love them, but they don't want to have to love themselves. Right? Mm. They don't want to have to love the other person. They don't want to have to love, period. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and this is a big problem that most people face. We've, we've got to be sincere about love. So when people come up and ask us emotional questions about their emotional state, oftentimes I say to you afterwards, babe, that wasn't the point. Mm. That person doesn't want to love. What's the point of having a discussion about all of these emotional reasons why they do this and why they do that? And it's to do with their mother this and their father that and their childhood this and their childhood that and all these different things going on when at the end of the day, they just don't want to love anyway. They're angry and bitter about love. They just don't want to love. Mm -hmm. Like, the only thing we can discuss with them in that place really is, you don't want to love, work out the reasons why. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? You yeah. don't want to do what God does. God loves. Mm -hmm. You don't want to love, work out the reasons why. You can't have a decent relationship with anybody while you're not wanting to love. Yeah. That's reality. Yeah. You can't have a decent relationship with children, with your parents, with, the, with society generally, or in fact, and mostly with your partner, if you don't want to love. Mm. You need to get beyond the rage and anger and rebellion that you feel about love, work your way through all of those things. Then you, will say, you could say, I want to love. When you get into that space, then it's worth talking about what emotions are stopping you because you'll want to deal with them then yeah. rather than ignore them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, well, we were halfway through the summary of what no, God's yeah, love does yeah, not do yeah. um, before that little sidetrack. Yeah. So just to finish off, God's love does not feed our addictions. God's love no. does not respond negatively to anger, no. nor does it pander to anger. No. God's love never responds to fear or attempts to make the fear in a person go away. Correct. God's love only responds to emotional based reality. Yes. In other words, anything intellectual that is just not part of a person's emotion, God doesn't respond to it at all. Anything that is emotional, that, that is a part of their real feelings, their real passion, their real desire, God responds to. Mm. So God's dealing with the real The real self. The real self. Not not the fake facade self that's all just intellectually based, full of denial about emotion. God's yeah. feeling the emotion and addressing the emotion. 
constantly. Yeah. And God's love never flows unless truth is desired in the moment. Yes. Yeah. So if we look at all of those things, that's what God's love does or does not do. And, uh, and so I feel once a person understands those particular questions about what does God's love do, they can ask themselves that question on many subjects and mm-hmm. find out lots of things about what God's love does. Mm-hmm. God's love does have laws, for example. So that doesn't mean that anything goes. So anybody who believes that love in a relationship means that anything goes <laughs> is out of harmony with God's love. Yeah. Right? So these are all things that a person can easily determine for themselves if they truly have a desire to love. Lovely. Thank you. What's the second most important question to ask in a relationship? Well, I've probably already alluded to it in the first question, and that is, do I really want to love in a pure way? So if, if, if I don't have God involved in my life, do I really want to love my partner in a pure way? Now, I would suggest that many people in a relationship don't want to love their partners in a pure way already. If I have God in my life, that question becomes, do I want to love the way God loves? Do I want to? How, how much do I want to? Is it the first thing in my life or is it just like, oh, yeah, I give it lip service, give it, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, I want to become like God. But there's no intention with inside of me to love in a pure way or the way God loves. Now, if we don't really want to love the way God loves, we're never going to ask ourselves the first question, and that is, what would God's love do? Mm -hmm. Or if we were an atheist or someone asking the question, it would be, what would a pure love do? Mm-hmm. We're never going to ask ourselves that question if we don't want to love. So, and, and there are so many reasons today why people don't want to love. Many people think that love is weak, love is stupid, that love has no benefits. That exposes us to being hurt. It exposes us to ridicule, exposes us to harm. It, it makes you gentle and soft, which is weakness. And all of these other things that they have, they feel, they feel they'd rather rebel and get angry and bitter and all of these other things. that They feel they'd rather do those things because they're scared of opening their heart. There's so many people who are just in rebellion to opening their heart. They don't want to open their heart because they might get hurt. Mm. These are all reasons why we don't want to love. And, and unless we're willing to ask ourselves in the relationship, do I really want to love here? Do I really want to? Or what are my real feelings? So what are my real feelings? And and the majority of times I feel a lot of people would answer, actually, I don't know if I really want to love. You know, I, I can remember having conversations with different people about this, you know, where a person would come up to me and say, look, my husband does this and does that and, and does these things. And what do you think I should do? Now, the answer they're really fishing for is leave him and find another husband. That's really the answer they're fishing for because that's not the answer I give them generally. Which The answer I give them generally is what do you do to love your husband? Do you tell him the truth? And, and quite often they go, well, no, I ask you about my husband. And I go, well, he's not here. Mm. You're here. And, and to me, the question needs to be self-focused. Like, what are you doing to bring your life in harmony with love? And oftentimes they walk away disgusted with the conversation mm-hmm. because they don't really want to know how to love. They really want to know how to leave. Mm. <laughs> they really want to know how to leave and get away with it. Yeah. And that's really what they want to know, not how to love. And <clears throat> I find that tragic. Mm. They're looking for a way to justify the leaving by yes. asking you. Yes. And that's also a part of wanting to remove themselves from personal responsibility for totally. the decision. Totally, which love would not do. Yeah. If they really wanted to love, they'd never try to place responsibility for their choices and decisions on another person, including Jesus. Mm-hmm. So, so the issue is often that they don't want to love. So I feel the second question each of us in a relationship needs to ask is, do you really want to love in a pure way? Do you really want to love the way God loves? Do you really want to learn the way God loves and copy it? Do you want to do that? Or are you just giving all of that lip service and making out and faking, trying to fake it because that's what I observe the majority of people in relationships doing. They're trying to fake this desire. They have no real desire to love. They have a desire to have a codependent, addictive relationship. And that's not love. 
and it's never going to result in pleasure. It's always going to result in pain and suffering. So the, the second important question is, do I want to love? Now, before we talk about the emotional injuries you have towards loving and the emotional injuries your partner has towards loving and discovering what you know, the truth is about why you find love difficult and why your partner finds love difficult and just talking about why you find it hard to open your heart and why your partner is doing this and that, talking about sexual issues and all these other things, you've got to ask the question first, do you really want to love? Because if you don't really want to love, Dealing with all of the, it's pointless even having discussion about all of those other questions. B because you're not going to sincerely want to love. You're not going to want to sincerely deal with all of those other questions even if we raise them. So it's like a waste of time. We need to, you need to know how much you want to love if you truly want to sort out any relationship and have a happy relationship. Mm -hmm. So I feel that's a key part of any decision that a person must make. Ask themselves, what does love do? But secondly, you've got to ask yourself, do I really want to do what love would do? <laughs> or yeah. do I just want to do some other things, you know, that are quite damaging and quite you know, unloving? What, what do I really want? And be honest about it, because you can't have a relationship with God or your partner if you can't be honest about that. Yeah. What are the benefits of loving God's way? Now, this is a very important question to answer, but also a very difficult question to answer for a person who has no idea of the benefits. <laughs> <laughs> so, so firstly, there are benefits in the relationship itself. There are personal benefits to yourself and benefits to the other person in the relationship. Obviously, if I love the way God loves, you feel relieved of all these problems that you would normally face if I did not love the way God's love. In addition, if I loved myself the way God loves me, I would also feel very happy, secure, safe in, in my own love of you and my own love of myself. I wouldn't feel you know, angry or upset at any time about those things. This creates a large degree of safety and security and intimacy in the relationship. So we have a very intimate, close, passionate relationship as a result. That's not, you know, where one person's withdrawing all the time, one person's withholding sex or all those kind of things. None of those things happen in a relationship where we love the way God loves. There is also benefits to our children because they get to see mirrored the way God loves. So they get to then be able to practice the same thing in their own relationships automatically. They don't have to try hard to understand the way it works. The people around us benefit on a number of ways, both, both directly and indirectly. Directly, they benefit because they get to see a relationship that's happy mirrored to them. They get to see what it likes or what, it look, what it's like or looks like to be in a relationship that's growing towards God and growing towards love. In addition, the society benefits indirectly because when we love each other and we're in a passionate relationship, we're not focused on all the negativity that's going on in the relationship. So now we can create. Mm -hmm. We can create in a passionate manner without worrying about what the other person feels and, you know, you know, and without working against each other. We're working with each other to create. This means that there's huge benefits to society now. So society doesn't have to deal with the unloving behaviour of one or both of us. So there's no such thing as having to, for a police, having to rock up at our home because our husband's been abused if or whatever. Because mm -hmm. all of that now goes out of the window because we want to love the way God loves. Or if we don't believe in God, we want to love in a pure way. Now, the desire or, or to love in a pure way has to be developed. But if we truly develop it, there will be so many benefits that are immeasurable and also for most people totally most people have no understanding of the possible benefits. Mm -hmm. Imagine living in a, a relationship where you never have an argument, but it's not because you don't disagree on matters. It's yeah. because you know how to disagree in love. Yeah. You know, imagine being in a situation where there's never this uh, you know, withholding of physical intimacy in the relationship because you both have a strong, passionate desire for each other. These are the kind of relationships that are possible but very few people, if any people, have them on earth, really. They are only possible if we love the way God loves. Mm -hmm. so, so I feel there are so many benefits on so many levels, not only to the relationship itself, to myself individually, to the relationship, to the other person in the relationship, 
to any children in the relationship, to any you know, people who surround us in the relationship, to our work life, to our private life, to our social life, to society generally and to our nation mm. and to the world. Mm. Uh, there's so many benefits that come from our relationship being a strong, loving relationship. And basically it sounds like you're describing a relationship that becomes more fulfilling. It, there's less tension, there's less disagreement. In fact, there's the, there's, in the end there's no, dis, there's exactly. no uh, um, dysfunction or aggression towards yeah. the other. Well, you often comment, there's, don't you, that we're working in our relationship towards our honeymoon. Yeah, that's <laughs> how I feel. Because at the beginning it was pretty rough and everything. There's all these emotions and addictions that get all triggered and everything. But as time goes on, as both of us develop this desire, this passionate desire to love the way God loves and to love in a pure way, the better the relationship becomes. And eventually it gets closer and closer and closer and eventually you're in the honeymoon and eventually in your honeymoon all the time. Like, yeah. so who wouldn't want that? Yeah, like, exactly. like, you'd be crazy not to want yeah. that, right? <laughs> and I often think that most commonly on the planet, we see people come together for their literal honeymoon yeah. when the codependence is very strong. Yeah. But because of the way God's designed our souls, when we're in codependent addiction, yeah. he's designed it because that's so out of harmony with love that that's going to be confronted. Exactly. And so then you see over years people feeling more and more distant and more and more disjointed as those things are confronted. And they're working confronted. away from each other. Yeah. And they're working away from each other because individually they haven't asked themselves that question, do I really want to love? Yeah. And secondly, they probably don't understand the benefits of doing so either. Yeah. They, they, although, when you think about it, most people have had some idea of the benefits right at the beginning of their relationship, mm. right? Um, but but this, in time, it gets destroyed. Yeah, and this their is... Their concept, I mean, gets destroyed. Of love. Well, of, of what a good relationship looks like, mm. you know. And in fact, there's a lot of people now who are in relationships on the planet who don't believe a good relationship is even possible, unfortunately. No. But it, and it's certainly not possible if we keep doing what we keep doing. Yeah. You know, if we keep doing what the average couple in a relationship do, a good relationship's not possible. <laughs> Hence, we have proof daily yes. surrounding us that good relationships are not possible if we keep doing the things our own way, our own definition. So really you're saying the benefits of loving God's way is that we will have long-term loving relationships. Yes. And this is what I... And in the strongly. end, if we, we'll attract our soulmates, which is a different question that we want to address at some point in the future in this discussion, but we'll attract our soulmates and so it will be an everlasting relationship that's yeah. beautiful and like a honeymoon, everlastingly, do you yes. know what I mean? So, yes. so um, you know, I feel that most of those kind of benefits are not examined by the majority of people. They don't feel that that's possible. They sort of lose even faith in the concept that a loving relationship is actually going to bring them those kind of benefits. Oftentimes what we see happening today is they view the opposite. They, see, they feel a loving relationship's like binding and restrictive and controlling and, you know, restricts the use of your will. And, and none of these things are true, mm. actually. But that's the way most people's relationships turn out because we don't love the way God loves. Mm. That's why they turn out that way. And so if we understood the benefits of loving the way God's love, we wouldn't hesitate to do it. However, the majority of us don't understand the benefits. And all we see is the way love pans out, love, as we call it, pans out on the earth. And we think it doesn't turn out very well. And many of us, as a result of that, get very resistive to loving anyway yeah. at all. You know? And this is why we have a growing number of people who are living alone on the planet. Because in the end, they don't see any benefits. They've become angry about love. But really, all they're angry about is the way the world loves. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. but, uh, but they become angry about love, and then they project that onto the way God loves. And so they don't want to love the way God loves. And in the end, you're never going to experience the benefits of such a beautiful, loving relationship if you don't love the way God loves. Most people say they don't know God well enough to know what God's love would do. Mm. What, what would you like to say in response to that comment? A few things. Firstly, they're just lying to themselves. Um, the reason why I say they're lying to themselves is that 
in every single moment of every single day, God is showing you how God acts with you. It's just the majority of people think they're not getting anything from God and that's because God's saying no to them the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason why God's saying no to them the whole time is because they are pretty much unloving the whole time <laughs> and yeah. have no desire to love or be in harmony with truth the whole time. And this is uh, one thing that we forget in our interaction with God. God always gives us direct feedback that's instant. God's universe is created to give us direct instant feedback to what's going on for us emotionally and what's going on at our soul, at our soul level. And also God is trying to help us develop our character at every point. If something is not happening, it's because the answer is no, right? If something is happening, it's because the answer is yes on those particular subjects, right? So, so if I'm having a lot of trauma in my life, then God's going, yes, you need a lot of trauma in your life because you're out of harmony of love all the time and you're breaking my laws all the time. And as a result, you're going to have a lot of trauma. Now, I have compassion for you in that situation, having all this trauma, but you've got to realise at some point that the reason for all this trauma is because you're out of harmony with my universe. Yeah. <laughs> and my universe is going to tell you that. Yeah. Um, so... When we say to ourselves, oh, we don't know how God loves, so I think I'll give up the whole question, what we're really saying is that we're not honouring the fact that God's interacting with us in every single moment of every single day and telling us every single moment of every single day what's really going on. And I see people doing this all the time, lying to themselves about how God is interacting with them. So, so for example, it, like sometimes they say to me questions like, just basic questions like, does God talk to you? And I say, well, does God talk to you? Do you hear God's voice talk to you? And they go, no. So why would you think God talks to me that way? God doesn't talk to me that way. <laughs> God doesn't talk to you. God doesn't talk to me voice on voice. So whenever you hear a voice from whatever source, you know it's not God's, <laughs> pretty much. Now, God does speak in another language, which is the language of love. In other words, God, God trans, the way God talks actually is through feelings of love for us. That's the way through which all communication happens from God. Right? But that's not the same as hearing a voice. Right? Yeah. So when a person says, oh, I had God told me the other day through a voice, such and such, this wasn't God. God doesn't talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if God talked to one person, then God would be talking and everyone would be hearing. Right. God has the power to manipulate your own eardrum. Therefore, God has the power to make that eardrum respond to God's speech. Mm -hmm. Therefore, God has the ability, if God wished to talk in that manner to you, God has the ability to talk in that manner to you. The fact that God's not doing that with the majority of us means that God doesn't do it. <laughs> so we need to look at what God is doing with every single one of us all the time. Exactly. What is God doing and with every single question. one of us all the time? So if someone comes along and says, oh, God spoke to me the other day. And it wasn't God that spoke to you. God, Because if God spoke to you, God would be speaking to everybody mm. okay. in the same way. right? If I'm talking now about human speech, about yes. the voice being heard in the ear. So what I'm basically saying is God, through God's actions with all of us collectively and individually, is demonstrating how God acts with us. And, and we are frequently lying to ourselves about that because we like to lie to ourselves because we like to believe things that are not true. And the reason why we like believing things that are not true is because we like to avoid the pain of hearing the truth or we like to avoid the fact that we're in an addiction with somebody or we like to, you know, we like to avoid the fact that we're not loving. In fact, in the end, that's what it's all about. That's what we're trying to do most of the time. And the only reason why we would ever believe that God doesn't, you know, that I don't know the way God loves is because you're not hearing much. <laughs> you're totally ignoring everything that God is doing every single moment with us to, to understand that God is actually acting with you right now in a loving way, right now. Every single person on this planet is having God's interaction with them in a loving way. So you're saying God is already in a loving relationship with every single person on the planet From at God's the perspective. Yep. Now, if I was someone who's raised in a home that had no mention of God, yep. and I heard this statement from you right now, mm -hmm. how would I then begin to discern or how do I wrap my 
my feelings around that or how do I examine my life mm-hmm. um, to, to understand what's God's part in it? See, now I think it's all too complicated. Even that question is too complicated. Okay. How God is treating me right now is, how, is, is the most loving thing that could happen, right? And it's even whether I don't believe in God or not, this is what is happening to me. Yeah. Right? So I don't feel like God's treating me anyway if, I I'm, if I'm in that category that I gave the example of. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't feel like God's treating you anyway, but God is. Right. So why is it? So, so are you hearing God right at the moment as a voice? No. No. So God doesn't do that. And if you asked God to talk to you in a voice, right, and, and God did, your question is, well, why doesn't everybody else who asked God to talk to them in a voice receive that? But it doesn't make any sense. God's consistent. God's, God's equal in sure. the way he deals with all of the children. So if God's talking to you in a voice and not in somebody else in a voice, then God's not equal anymore, you know, in the treatment of us. Mm-hmm. So the fact is God is equal in the treatment of us. There are certain things that are engaged every single time. So, mm-hmm. so even with the fact of how God communicates can be determined quite simply by how is God treating me right now? Mm-hmm. Right? Does God rescue me right now? So when I go, if there's a God, get me out of my financial situation. <laughs> yeah. And God's there going, not saying anything, <laughs> not doing anything. God would instantly respond and has the power to get you out of your financial situation. Mm-hmm. And if God hasn't instantly responded and given you the power to get out of the situation, then you've got to assume that God doesn't want to. <laughs> not assume that God's not listening. Yeah. Assume that God doesn't want to. Right? That's how God's telling us what God wants. This is how we find out how God loves. Right? God doesn't do anything God doesn't want to do. <laughs> and... And so if we ask for something and don't get it, then it's because God didn't want to answer it in the way that we wanted the answer. Mm. Quite simple, right? There's something out of harmony with love in our demand Mm -hmm. or in our expectation. And I suppose the other thing that we often do is we live out our lives and then blame God for all the negative things that happen in it. Of course. So we sort of avoid our personal responsibility for everything. Of course. So that's number two. So the first thing is I believe that anybody who says to me, that you know, they don't really know what God is you know, saying to them or they don't really know how God loves, they're, avoiding, they're really lying to themselves and they're avoiding the truth that every single moment of every single day, God is trying to show us how God loves. And if we're not receiving anything, it's because we're already out of harmony with it. Yeah. The second thing is that quite often we revert to blame of God for not coming to our rescue or coming to help us or whatever else. And, and in a way... What we're really saying in that moment is we're saying, I know how to love, but God doesn't. Now, that makes no logical sense because if God created us, then God surely knows a lot more about love than we do, right? Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's also not logical on a personal level to say, God's not teaching me about love when God doesn't come to our rescue because God is trying to teach you about love. Love doesn't come to a person's rescue when they personally have created things out of harmony with love. (laughs) That is one of the truths that God is trying to teach you in that moment that you're obviously ignoring. And when we place all this blame on God, we are actually doing the, we are doing the opposite of what we need to do. And that is take personal responsibility for the creation of your own life. Now, how does this relate to relationships? I see people doing this all the time. They're saying, I don't know how God loves, so I don't want to do that. They're sort of using it as an excuse. So I don't know how to treat you. I don't know how to treat you. What a heap of crap. Like, honestly, from an ethical point of view, I know how to treat you. I know how I don't want to be treated myself. And so as long as I don't treat you the same way, then I've already got half the equation covered. And I also know how I like to be treated by you. And so if I do the same things in return, I've almost got the whole equation covered. (laughs) So to then say that I don't know much about love and so therefore I don't know how how to act in harmony with love and my partner is disclaiming any personal responsibility for personal ethics. And I see people in relationships doing this all the time. They're they're so unethical in their relationship. So they're demanding to their partner and I say to them, but if your partner demanded the same thing from you, how would you feel? 
I'd feel this and I'd feel that and I'd feel this pretty well. So why do you think you should get away with demanding it from your partner? Like, how do you feel as a man if your partner, you know, if you, you were looking after the kids all day, your partner come home from work and said, where's the dinner on the table? How would you feel if you were the man, you know, looking after children all day? All right? How would you feel? Would you like that? No, most men would say no, I wouldn't like that at all. But then we say, so why are you doing that, that when you come in the door? You know, would you like it having to clean up after all your wife's bras, knickers, your socks, you know, you know, underclothes, everything in the shower? And every, if what, her, your wife put all of her cosmetics all over the place and you had to come along and clean it up, would you like all of that? No. Well, then why do you do that to her? That, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's quite simple. Mm -hmm. The question is a matter of ethics. And any person who says to themselves, that I don't know the way God loves, all they've got to do is go, okay, what is the ethical thing to do? Because God's always ethical. Yeah. <laughs> right? What is the ethical thing to do in my relationship? And they'll already cover 80 to 90% of what, how God loves in that, in that question. What I observe happening in relationships is the opposite to that. They have one set of ethics for themselves and one set of ethics for their partner and the two often are nowhere near the same. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the unfortunate truth. And unless that changes, there is not going to be a very happy relationship as a result. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. You said that the primary question we need to ask ourselves in a relationship is what would love do? Mm. Are there secondary questions to add to this primary question to help us understand it better? Certainly, um, because love has its uh, expanse in a lot of different areas. Obviously, there are what I feel are four basic questions. Two of them relate to myself and two of them relate to my partner that I would ask. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, my partner, if they ask the same questions, two would relate to me and two would relate to herself. And I, so under these circumstances, basically eight different questions are being answered now. So, so we've got eight primary questions that need to be asked in a relationship, four being asked by myself and four being asked by my partner. But let's look at the four questions. Now, remember I said there were two that were primary so, so, and, and two relate to myself, two relate to my partner so that make up the four. So let's look at the two questions. The first question I need to ask myself is what would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? Mm -hmm. That's primary, that's question number one. What would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself. Number two, what would my love for my partner motivate me to do for my partner? Mm -hmm. That's the question I need to ask. Mm -hmm. This is my questions I need to ask. Now, if we look at those two questions, they are very much, and these are the first questions we need to ask ourselves, they are all focused about my love the development of my love. Yes. Most of the time when people come to me to ask questions about a relationship, they never ask about themselves. They always ask something about the other person and what they should be doing, mm -hmm. which already indicates that their focus, their, their primary point of interest is already skewed away from themselves onto what the other person should be doing. The reality is these first two questions, what would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? And what would my love for my partner motivate me to do for my partner? They are the two most important questions we first need to ask yes. because they are about my love. Now, the reason why they're the two most important questions we need to ask is because the only person's love I can change is my own. Mm -hmm. I have no control over your love. You have control over your love. There's nothing I can do about your love yeah. and how you display or want to display your love. The only thing I have the power to change is my love. So that's why they are the first two questions we need to ask. Yeah. These are the questions that have the most empowering change over our relationship because I 
have them under my control. Yeah. I have the ability to change these areas. So they are the first two. Now, yeah. now we need to ask two more questions. They're basically the same first two questions asked from my perspective of my partner. Mm-hmm. So, so, so let's, let's say it as if it's... So before, the first question was, what would my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? To put that now from my perspective on my partner is, what would my partner's, what do I feel mm-hmm. my partner's love for themselves would motivate them to do for themselves? <laughs> so what do I feel about that? What, what are my feelings about their love for themselves and what it would motivate them to do for themselves? And then the second question is, what do I feel my partner's love for me would motivate them to do for me? Right? Mm-hmm. So it's the same two questions as the first two questions, but asked by, from my own perspective, not from a partner's perspective, but my own. What do I feel they would do, basically, if they loved themselves and if they loved me? That's basically the two questions in summary. What do I feel they would do with their love of me? And themselves. And themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, those four questions I would ask from my own perspective, not from my partner's perspective, because my partner's perspective at this point is immaterial. I can only assess things from these four positions. I I can change my love, which is the first two questions, and I can look at and examine the way in which my partner expresses her so called love for me, or her so-called love for herself? These are the four questions I need to ask myself. Now, if my partner asked herself the same four questions, then she would be saying the same things. What does my love for myself motivate me to do for myself? What does my love for my partner, me, in other words, motivate her to do for me? (laughs) What What do I feel my, my partner's love for himself would motivate him to do for himself and what do I feel my partner's love for me would motivate him to do for me? Yeah. They are the four questions she would ask. Right? And now, if we are both sincere about asking those four questions, we can resolve a huge amount of emotional issues between each other quite, quite readily, in fact if we're sincere about asking the four questions. Mm. And that's because if, <coughs> some, if we answer in the negative to any one of those questions, as in, mm-hmm. no, my love for me would not have me do this, or my love, if I had sincere love for my partner, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't this. do this. It's a way, it's a way of um, checking our behaviour, isn't it, and our feelings yeah. in regards to love. Yeah. So, so we... So let's examine it from a, you know, let's look at a few different example things. We'll look at more examples in the next question perhaps. But if we look at a few brief examples, for, for example, I'm about to drop my clothes on the floor. <laughs> what would my love for me motivate me to do with my own clothes? It surely wouldn't be to drop them on the floor. Yeah. What would my love for my partner motivate me to do with my clothes. Certainly not to drop them on the floor where they can trip over them, you know, tread on them, have to move them or whatever. Quite easy to see what I would do. How about we go for a more serious situation? Like, I'm about to cheat on my partner. What would my love for me motivate me to do here? Well, a lot of people go, yeah, cheat. That that would be great. But what would my love for my partner motivate me to do? It wouldn't motivate me to cheat. And how would you feel if your partner decided to cheat? That's the next, the third question. Oh, oh sorry, and the fourth question. How would you feel if they decided they would cheat under, in the same situation? You wouldn't be that happy, right? Mm. So it's quite obvious what you should do. Don't cheat. If you feel sexually attracted to someone, go to your partner, talk to them about that, talk to them about what's going on, why, what's, what emotions, work through the issues. Don't cheat. <laughs> Right? If you loved your partner, if you asked those four questions, you would never do it. Right? Often we don't, of course. So, yeah. 
So we don't follow through with those particular questions. And I personally have been in a situation where I haven't followed through with some of these questions in different issues, right? So, I'm, so, and until we're perfect, we're not going to follow through with these questions on different issues. However, you can see that if we just ask those four questions every time, you basically already have a pretty close to perfect relationship, actually. In that you'd see the issues as they arise and you would have the, t the, the um You'd see when there's a, an obvious issue of love. Well, not only that, you'd see when there's an obvious issue of love, but you would also probably have exposed within yourself the feeling you have. So you're about to drop the clothes on the floor and you ask yourself, like, is this a loving thing to do for myself? And the answer is no. And yet you go ahead and drop the clothes on the floor. What does that tell you? You don't, don't know, know how to love yourself. yourself. Yeah. That's what it tells you. There's a problem there. It exposes immediately the underlying emotional issue. Right? If you ask yourself, uh, yes, I'm going to drop it on the floor because it's loving to myself and you don't believe that, but if you ask yourself, if I drop this on the floor, is that loving to my partner? And you have to go, no. And then you still drop it on the floor. You've got to question whether you really love your partner mm. or how selfish you are in the relationship. Already your selfishness is being exposed if you ask yourself that question. So what I, what I feel is great about it is that it gives you the opportunity to see why you want to undertake unloving behaviour in your relationship when you ask those questions. Mm. So that's what I feel is one of the major benefits. You get to see yourself as you truly are <laughs> in the relationship rather than making out that everything's fine when you're chucking clothes on the floor all the time or everything's fine when you come walking in the house and where's my dinner, you know, or everything's fine when, you know, you, you feel like you should have sex every night, but you don't have any intimacy other times. You know, you would never do or feel all of those things if you asked yourself the questions. Yeah, yeah and I like, I like that in these four questions, there's, there's almost an equal weight placed upon the love for self, the love for the other, the other's love for self and the other's love for you. Of course. Um, I like that there's... There's not really a hierarchy. Even though we can't alter our partner's feelings towards themselves or towards us, we're still giving regard to them. Yes. Because a lot of people um, say with the issue of dropping the clothes on the floor, yeah. we might say, look, I'm really tired. I've had a big day. It's loving for me right now to go and flake out on the couch. I'm dropping the, I'm dropping the clothes. Yeah. But then we go, love for my partner. Well, my partner hasn't had such a busy day, whatever, I'm dropping the clothes. But then we get to the third and fourth question and say, yeah, but if I've dropped these clothes, what would my partner's love for herself or himself have them do when they come upon these clothes? Yeah. Is it always going to be loving for them to help me avoid things and to pick up my clothing? Yeah, to and be honest, probably walk all over them. That's what their love of themselves might motivate them to do. <laughs> yeah, or at least say... I'm sick of living. Well, I, in after a, a while, you even yeah. give up saying that, don't you? So, what, just you might as well just walk over it. And if the person then complains who dropped the clothes, complains that the clothes are all dirty because they're like, well, you left them there. Mm. Like, what else am I meant to do? I've asked you to not do that so many times. And your love of yourself would motivate me you to not do it anyway. And if you love me, you would definitely not do it. So, what else am I meant to do? Mm. Like, yeah, and this is where the fourth question comes in. If my partner loved me, would they help me by always picking up my clothes? Or would it be... I, I feel it's just a really um, good way of considering all aspects of an issue. Of course. Yeah. And it's ethical. Yeah. The way the questions are designed are ethical. In other words, I'm placing the same amount of weight emotionally and physically on the question for myself that I am placing on my partner. And my partner's doing the same. Now, if we're both ethically dealing with each other in the relationship, there's a high likelihood that we have far less problems in the relationship than we currently have. Mm -hmm. yeah. What if we don't want to ask the questions? Well, uh, again, I feel if we don't want to ask the questions, then you've really got a question whether you should be in a relationship. Because uh, honestly, if you don't want to ask these kind of questions, which are all based around ethics and love, with regard to a relationship, then maybe you shouldn't be in one because you're obviously quite a selfish character <laughs> and you have no real desire for a relationship. <laughs> and what so. hope is there for a relationship where we don't ha hold the love of ourselves, our love of our partner, exactly. to equal regard of our partner's love of themselves and love of us? Exactly. There's no hope. In the end, the relationship has to degrade. It cannot improve.
Yeah. In the, and, and later I think we talk about a question about what happens, you know, why would you split up in a relationship? And in the end, a lot of, a lot of relationships break up because of the unethical behaviour between one or both parties. Yeah. And if you if you examine if you're not willing to examine these questions, both parties are not willing to examine these questions in a relationship. It's highly unlikely the relationship's going to survive, mm. let alone thrive, yeah. let alone grow. Yeah. It's not even going to survive yeah. because it, because sooner or later the unethical behaviour adds up and adds up and and we and we finish up hitting what I feel is like a a no return point almost in a relationship. Where, where there's so much unethical behaviour that's gone on, usually from one or both parties, that, <clears throat> that it goes on for such a long period of time that we, we lost all sense of love in the process of having the relationship and also all sense of desire about getting back the relationship. Mm. In other words, we've lost all sense of desire to be in a relationship with that person. And when that happens, very hard to recover from that place even if that person is your soulmate. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to recover. There's a lot of forgiveness that has to happen, a lot of repentance that has to happen, a lot of working way through emotional issues that has to happen beyond that point before you could ever be open and close again. Mm -hmm. So I feel it's almost like if you treat every single person, that you, you know, your partner that you're with at the moment as if they are your soulmate, you wouldn't want to leave your soulmate um, only to have to come back with a lot of crap to work your way through as a result of, in the terms of forgiveness and repentance. Mm -hmm. You want to, if you're going to relieve the relationship, you want to leave it in a, in a space where both of you, or at least one of you, but probably both of you realise that it's not working because you're not soulmates, not because, not because you're ignoring issues, you're of, ignoring love. issues of love. Yeah. Yeah. And when I say not working because you're not soulmates, it's not working because you don't have the same desires and passions and personality traits and all those kind of things which are a part of being a soulmate. Mm -hmm. The rela reality is every single relationship on this planet can work, right? With one exception and that is if you don't have the same desires, passions and longings in your pure state, then sooner or later you'll be drawn away from each other. Even if you love each other, you'll be drawn away from each other, right? That's the only time where it's not where love isn't going to keep you together, mm -hmm. as the saying goes. So love doesn't necessarily keep us together. What it does is it allows us to live in harmony with love in the moment, right? So, so really what we need to understand through these four questions is if I'm asking the four questions, you're asking the four questions, we are able to have a completely harmonious relationship and a completely harmonious love-based relationship even if our passions and desires are not the same. Right? However, at some point in our future, as we develop our passions and desires further, we'll realise that our passions and desires are not the same and that's probably what will lead us to part and find our soulmate who will have the same passions and desires that we have. Yeah. But it won't be because of our answering the negative of these four questions that we leave. It'll be because we're fully engaged in trying to live in harmony with these four questions. Yeah. It's completely the opposite to what most people think. Yeah. So, so I believe these four questions, supplementary questions, let's call it, to that primary t couple of questions. The primary couple of questions are the first one being God in terms of what would God's love do, or if we're not involved in God, what would pure love do, mm -hmm. is the first primary question. The second primary question is, do I want to love in a pure way, or yeah. if I've got God in my life, do I want to love the way God loves, mm -hmm. is, this, is the second primary question. Then we have these four supplemental questions, which I feel are essential part of our understanding of a relationship. If we can answer in the positive to all four of those questions with any situation, it's going to make us closer, more content with each other, happier with the relationship, more secure in the relationship and so forth. If one, just one of these questions is answered in the negative, then it means that we've got a problem with love, that we need to repair whether we're with our soulmate or not. Let's face it, we need to repair any issue we love, whether we're with our soulmate or not. Yeah. So let's repair it. Let's have it through our first, our second primary question, which is, do I want to do it? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I want to fix my relationship. I want to bring my part of it into harmony with love. Do it. 
and take action along those, uh, those lines. And these four supplementary questions will help you do that. Yeah, yeah. great, great, thank you. Mm.